Let me introduce Justin Chan. He's from the University of Washington. He's a PhD candidate there in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and he's also a faculty candidate in our Digital Health Initiative. And so his, his research is on smartphones for a, a, a range of applications from uh, in health, ear to uh, hearing systems, let's see, cardiac arrest detection, smart speakers. So many real world applications for healthcare. So welcome, Justin. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy to be here and thank you for inviting me for the interview. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about some of my work on intelligent mobile systems. I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about myself. I design computational techniques and methods for intelligent mobile systems. And over the course of my PhD, I've worked across a pretty broad range of application areas. And this has included um, underwater uh, networking and smart RF surfaces, the internet of plastic things, smart fabrics, and even augmented audio for intelligent earables. But of course, for today's talk, what I really want to focus on is one key application area where I've had the most amount of practical impact and which is also very personally rewarding to me. And that is equitable healthcare. So I want to begin by explaining to you what I mean by equitable healthcare. Health inequities often show up in the global health setting, where the country that a person is born in can have a huge effect on their ability to access even basic medical resources like hearing care. And this is often due to the prohibitively high prices of medical devices that makes it really hard to access this sort of basic care. In the US, if you look at this map here, even in adjacent zip codes, health inequities happen because the life expectancy between these individuals can vary by up to 13 years. And these inequities, unfortunately, are actually being made worse by some smart devices like smart watches, which are made for health, but it actually costs hundreds of dollars, which makes it inaccessible to lots of the world. The final inequity are inequities due to financial incentives. And this shows up often in the case of rare diseases that only affect a relatively small proportion of the population. And it's because of this that there are actually not many financial incentives for the pharmaceutical and medical device companies to create solutions for these populations. I create intelligent mobile systems for equitable healthcare. And there's been a lot of interest recently in using computing and machine learning models for healthcare solutions. But what I build are end-to-end -end intelligent mobile systems. Intelligent meaning that I invent novel methods that can enable novel applications often in the clinical domain and often for mobile devices that have not been possible before. Mobile meaning that what I create is specifically for resource constrained devices like embedded devices that can process uh, the sensor data in real time. Finally, the systems part means that what I do spans the entire stack from the hardware sensors to the software to the machine learning model and it can be deployed in practical environments in the wild. I made several contributions across my PhD to address these forms of health inequities. In the global setting, I've created a tool that can use uh, two to three dollar earphones, kind of like this, that can be used to screen for newborn hearing loss. And I've also done um, a really cool test that can do blood clot testing just using a phone. In the domestic setting, I've created systems that can detect ear infections and also detect cardiac arrests. And finally, in the space of inequities due to financial incentives, I've created a wearable device that can detect and reverse an opioid overdose, as well as some ongoing work for um, a personalized interaction system for children that have rare forms of speech impediments. Now, designing all these systems is actually quite technically challenging for several reasons. First, if you look at how traditional medical devices are made, those are kind of focused on a single piece of golden hardware, like calibrated fixed hardware. Um, but in this new model, we're trying to use mobile devices such as smartphones and smart speakers. They're not designed to do medical diagnostics with those sensors. But there's also a diversity of hardware um, across. So for example, acoustic sensors, that will vary. And even worse, those can actually degrade over time. Some of those sensors can change. The second technical challenge 
is that if you look at these, uh, this here, this ear sensing device, it's supposed to sense things in the ear, it uses these acoustic sensors that are really quite expensive and it, or they're really very sensitive and it's because of that that they're very expensive, costing thousands of dollars. So the question is, if you want to have equitable health, you're going to need to use low cost hardware and that's an example of a low cost uh, speaker and microphone sensor there. Can you perform just as well as this? That's the important problem. You need to get the same high clinical accuracies using that low cost hardware. Finally, for these systems to scale across different hardware and different environments, you need to find inventive new ways to collect, curate, and augment data because sometimes the data can be sparse or very difficult to collect. My toolkit to solve these set of problems ranges from wireless sensing, signal processing, applied machine learning, and embedded hardware. And in particular, I designed techniques that leverage these toolkits to solve those problems. And here are the techniques that I use. I create wireless sensing and machine learning techniques so that these systems can actually scale across a broad range of hardware and can actually be deployed in reality. The second is I leverage hardware and software co-design so that you can get the best of both worlds of low cost hardware and also high clinical accuracies. And the final technique is a data collection and augmentation methods that can allow you to scale these systems to various hardware. In today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on three different systems where I've had the most amount of practical impact. The first is detecting ear infections just using smartphones and a simple paper cone. And I'll be demonstrating here the wireless sensing techniques that allow us to scale this across multiple devices. The second project is on using those low cost earphones to screen for newborn hearing loss. And I'll be demonstrating how hardware and software co-design can give you those high clinical accuracies. The final system is an ambient sensing system that can leverage smart speakers like Alexa's to detect cardiac arrests. So let's begin with the first system. Ear infections are actually the number one reason that children have to see a doctor today. And this is often because of fluid that actually builds up in the middle ear space behind the eardrum. So normally a doctor would try to inspect the child's ear like this, but this is actually very inaccurate to do this visually because it's hard to see behind the eardrum. And moreover, this requires an in-person visit, which makes it inequitable, especially to folks in lower income backgrounds who may not be able to take time off from work. In fact, medical studies have shown that even in this very specific space of ear infection detection, inequities do occur and they run across socioeconomic and racial lines. Okay, so you might ask, how do we in fact diagnose an ear infection today? Clinical guidelines from the American Academy of Otolaryngology say you need to do two things. First, you need to have symptoms of ear pain or fever, and you can obviously check that with a thermometer or just by looking at the child. And the second is you need an objective method to test for middle ear fluid. And that's what the system that we're going to create is trying to uh, resolve. The intuition for how it works is as follows. So this is a bottle of water. And depending on the amount of fluid in the water, if I tap in it, it's going to sound different. Um, if it were made out of glass, it would be more obvious. But it would sound different. And you can apply this analogy to the space of ears, where depending on the amount of fluid behind the eardrum, you can kind of probe for the mobility of the eardrum and you get a different sound. And the idea here is we're going to send a soft acoustic chirp from 1.8 to 4.4 kilohertz through the speaker at the base of the smartphone, through this paper cone, through the ear canal, so it reaches the eardrum. Now the eardrum is one millimeter thick. It's really thin, like a piece of paper. So most sound is actually gonna go through the eardrum and very little will be reflected back, like so. So not much is going to come back to the microphone. And the signal that you record is going to look a little bit like this. In contrast, when you do have middle ear fluid that builds up behind the eardrum, it will restrict the vibrational capacity of the eardrum. It'll be stiff, kind of like a solid object. So when you do send sound towards it, most sound will actually be reflected back. And this will create destructive interference between the signal that you're actually sending into the ear. And you will get a signal like this. And you can take these set of curves 
and put it through a machine learning classifier to distinguish between whether the person has fluid or not. And you can even um, get a coarse measure of the amount of fluid because this is a continuous measure as well. A really key important point to note here is that this leverages a very unique geometric feature of pretty much all modern smartphones. I mean, if you looked at the base of your smartphone right now, you would probably notice that there's a speaker and a microphone that's co-located at the base. And that's very convenient for us, but it's there for a functional purpose, which is actually noise cancellation for phone calls. And we can leverage that unique geometry by enveloping it with a paper cone that guides sound in and out of the ear. Now that's a simplified explanation of how that technique works, but if you really want to scale the system up to lots of different smartphones, there are different technical challenges that you need to take into account. The first is that the acoustic hardware, specifically the speaker and the microphone, their frequency response will actually decay over time. So like two or three months down the line, the frequency response will actually change. And when you're building a machine learning model, you need to actually take this into account. The second challenge is that the frequency response from one smartphone to the next will differ. So what are the implications of this? If you're building a system and you want to support new smartphones, you don't want to collect new clinical data for every smartphone you want to support because that is just um, inefficient in terms of scaling. So you need to actually resolve that. The third and final challenge is that depending on the way that you're taping this paper waveguide to the phone, that's going to change the reflection profile because there will be a very unique reflection profile depending on how you tape it. So you need to, in fact, normalize across all these conditions. And the way that we can do this, our intuition is that you can normalize across all these hardware variances by placing your fingertip at the base of the paper cone, first send a signal towards the finger, and get the frequency response back. And then using this information, you can um, get a profile that reflects all those different variances. And for subsequent measurements into the ear, you can normalize or compensate for the signal that's coming out of uh, the phone to a flat frequency response uh, for all subsequent measurements into the ear. And with this approach, we can train a machine learning model that can actually generalize to different pieces of hardware or different smartphones over time. I want to give you a very quick live demo of how this test can be performed. So this is the phone here with the paper cone, and I'm going to press measure, count down three seconds, and it'll go into my ear. So let's do that. So you may have heard those chirps just now, but you get a binary reading just like this that says it's unlikely, and you get the nice shallow curve that I showed you earlier so that's saying that, thankfully, I do not have an ear infection. Okay, now how do we evaluate our system? To do this, we collected training data from pediatric patients and they were in the operating room just about to get ear surgery for ear fluid or really um, different varieties of ear conditions. And a natural question is, how do you know with 100% certainty if there's fluid behind the eardrum? How do you get that gold standard ground truth? And um, the way to do this is actually make, to make an incision in the eardrum and I'm going to play a very short video of a surgery. So content warning, if you're uncomfortable with that, please close your eyes and I'll tell you when I'm done playing the video. Okay, so here you can see that the surgeon is making a tiny incision into the eardrum and you can see the fluid coming out. And that is really the way that we can know that 100% certainty um, that there's fluid or not behind the ear. Okay, so I'm done playing the video. We evaluated our tool in a cohort of 135 patient ears, and the age range was 18 months to 17 years, so it spanned the whole pediatric range. Our accuracies uh, was a sensitivity of 85% and a specificity of 82%, which is comparable to the specialist tools that you might have to wait a month or more to go to a specialist to actually get that, um, those type of accuracy. We then took our frozen machine learning model and tested it on a held out test set of ears that were collected on a completely different smartphone and evaluated the performance on that held out test set. And we got a comparable uh, performance with a sensitivity of 82% and a specificity of 80%. And this was uh, 125 uh, patient ears. To ensure that this technology can really have the impact that it can uh, have, we have commercialized this in a form of a startup where uh, we're trying to bring this technology to millions of people. 
Specifically, we have a flat pad paper design here with adhesive and that's already pre-cut that the patient can then tape to their phone. The really nice thing about this technology is that it's now FDA listed and it can be used at select clinical facilities. And when you're designing these type of medical tools when you're in this digital health space, one really important consideration is to think about whether the tool that you're creating can in fact meet the regulatory performance requirements, which is what we did when we were designing the system. Another really interesting thing to consider is that this type of system actually falls under an existing Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement code. So it can in fact be used in virtual telemedicine appointments, which is again another thing to keep into account when you're designing these kind of systems. Okay, so that was the first system where I've been talking about detecting ear infections using a smartphone and a simple paper cone. So now let's move on to the second system. And this also has to do with the space of ears. And I wanna emphasize to you that even though we're just concentrating on one particular human organ, there are a lot of impactful technologies that you can invent just by understanding the details of the biology and the physiology of just that one organ. So some context here, um, there are about 1.5 billion people around the world that are directly or indirectly affected by hearing loss in some way. And 80% of these people do reside in low and middle income countries. As you can imagine, really early detection of hearing loss is important to avoid any negative effects on neurodevelopment. In a high income country like the US here, every child that is born in this country, in fact, gets a screen for hearing loss at about one month of age. Now, you can't ask a newborn if they can hear a sound because they obviously can't respond. So you might ask, how do you in fact screen for newborn hearing loss? Well, hearing loss actually has to do with a different part of the ear. Previously, I was talking about the middle ear space, but now it's the inner ear, specifically the cochlea, that shell-shaped portion that has to do with the hearing test that I'm about to describe. When you hear a sound, what happens is the sound wave travels all the way through to the inside of the cochlea, and the hair cells within that cochlea will actually vibrate really energetically on the right, as you can see over there. Now, you normally think that the eardrum or the ear is just like a microphone, it just absorbs sound, right? But in fact, the ear acts like a speaker as well because these soft vibrations create sound. And these sounds are actually so soft that they're actually below the human audibility threshold. So sometimes humans can't even hear them. But if you place a very sensitive device by the outside of the ear, you could in fact tease out these soft sounds, look at the response at different frequencies, and then you basically have the hearing profile of that patient. The problem, of course, is that because these devices are so sensitive, they're pretty expensive and they're hard um, to purchase, especially in these low and middle income countries. So we created two systems to actually address this issue, these very low cost systems. One here is a smartphone based system that uses those earphones that I showed earlier. You normally get them on a plane, you throw them away, but you can leverage this as part of like a $10 design that uses software running in real time on the phone to tease out these very soft sounds from the ear just using very commodity hardware. And the second system is a wireless Bluetooth system here and it's a little bit like an Apple AirPod where there's a speaker and a microphone that can send sound into the ear and tease out those very soft sounds and will stream that over the air, over Bluetooth to a smartphone for processing. Now, building this kind of a system does require addressing several key technical challenges. The first is that these uh, microphones are not designed to detect these very soft sounds in comparison to the high-end microphones on these very expensive medical devices. The second challenge is that when you're sending sound into the ear, you're going to get reflections from the ear canal, the eardrum, the earbud case, and these will be a lot louder than the sounds coming from the cochlea, and those sounds can potentially overwhelm the cochlea signal. Finally, the system does need to work across different ear canal lengths and geometries, which will vary by each different person as they age and so on. To address these challenges, we leverage two very interesting uh, properties about uh, the cochlea. The first is that the reflections coming from the ear canal and the eardrum will arrive at the microphone much earlier in time. And only after will the sounds, the signals from the cochlea arrive back at the microphone. 
It's one observation. And the second observation is this really unique property about the cochlea, where the large end of the cochlea there will respond to high frequency sounds first, and you get those back. And only after will you get the uh, part of the signal that's coming that responds at a low frequency, because that's the innermost part of the cochlea. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, because um, typically we test at a range of about one to five kilohertz, which is tends to be the most important for human speech. That's what the audiologists have uh, figured out. And you can actually get a fairly precise profile, like what is the hearing level at each different frequency. And uh, for screening tests, you can just say uh, three out of four of these frequencies pass, then that child is okay to go on. If not, let's refer them to a, a further diagnostic. That's the idea. That's right, and you can actually precisely measure the signal to noise ratio of those vibrations. And you can have specific cutoffs to determine, um, there are some preset cutoffs that you can figure out, and you can vary that too, um, to actually optimize the system for the best uh, accuracies. Now, um, more formally, um, let's represent the signal that you're sending to the ear as a linear combination of sines and cosines, right here, x of t, that's what you send into the ear. The reflections coming back are going to be different uh, copies of the transmitted signal coming back at different delays delta i, different delays at different times. And finally, the signal coming from the cochlea can be approximated as this equation. And there are a set of terms that I want to draw your attention to. This delta i term here is a frequency dependent term. And what it's trying to model is the fact that sounds of different frequencies will come back at different delays, which is what we saw right just now with how the cochlea was modeled. The second set of terms are the alpha i and the beta i terms here, which are in fact, um, those um, represents the amplitude of those vibrations um, that I was mentioning earlier. So if you can figure out those alpha i and beta i terms there, that is actually representative of the hearing profile. The reflections, uh, one thing that's really interesting to note is that the reflections are linear properties of what you send in, but the signals coming from the cochlea are actually nonlinear toward the signal that you're transmitting into the ear. Now, we invented a two-step protocol to tease out these soft sounds from the cochlea. And the goal of the first step is you want to estimate the duration over which these unwanted reflections are occurring. And to do this, we set a, a, linear, a frequency modulated chirp from five to 15 kilohertz over 200 milliseconds into the ear and you get back reflections at different time delays corresponding to the different obstacles in the ear. And the interesting observation here is that different time delays of the reflections are associated with a unique frequency shift. So what this means is you can take a Fourier transform over the signal that you've received, get those frequency shifts and convert that to a time delay so you can figure out exactly what is the duration over which the reflections are occurring. After that, that brings us to the second step, where you can ignore that previous duration where the reflections are occurring and look at um, what's after that time delay. But here, the goal is to elicit those uh, responses from the cochlea. And to do that, we don't send a chirp. We send a wide band pulse from zero to five kilohertz. It's 500 microseconds uh, in size. And you just send that into the ear. And what's gonna come back is actually a very low amplitude, but you can combine the responses over time to actually boost the signal to noise ratio and detect these signals robustly in the ear. There are other algorithmic details that I won't cover, and this includes a power adaptation algorithm to deal with different ear canal lengths, and also a noise detection algorithm, because you're deploying these in real crying and moving children, so you need to distinguish between motion and uh, signal. Uh, here's a schematic of the hardware that we designed. There's a microphone, a speaker, a microcontroller, and a Bluetooth low energy chip. Uh, we use a 100 milliamp hour uh, lithium polymer battery, and it can last for 90 tests on a single charge, and each test can be about 60 seconds. And the whole cost here, the material cost is $28 each at a quantity of 1,000 devices. So now let's move on to the evaluation of this system. This was tested in 251 patient ears across three clinical sites, 
and the age range was one week to uh, 20 years of age. Uh, we tested both the traditional $5,000 clinical device in parallel with our low-cost device. And here's the AUC curve for the $5,000 medical device. And here's the performance for our device. You can clearly see that the performance is comparable, and we were able to get this at, at orders of magnitude lower cost. Now, a subgroup analysis that we should perform here is in the infant population from zero to six months, because that is the population where this hearing screening has the most value. And these orange bars represent the performance of the $5,000 medical device. And here it is for our device, which is comparable. Oh. Yes, um, for hearing loss, let me see if I have the statistic. Um, I don't remember exactly how many had hearing loss. It wasn't about 50-50, it was about uh, a third or so had hearing loss. So we deliberately went out to the hearing loss clinics and we captured a broad array. So uh, there are different types of hearing loss. Some uh, affects the air conduction, some affects the bone conduction. So that's conductive and sensory neural. And you have um, representation between these in the data set. And also different degrees from mild hearing loss to profound hearing loss. So you deliberately went to get a representative array of that. Um, to make sure that um, it's uh, around, I think, a third or so hearing loss, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there's actually a uh, mild hearing loss is the lowest form of hearing loss. And sometimes you may get a little bit of the signal from the cochlea at that. But if you start getting to severe or profound, you basically don't get any of those, uh, those uh, signals from the cochlea at all. But there is a somewhat of a relationship. Yes. Um, so this test uh, is typically not used in adults except for diagnostic purposes. So there are very specific diseases where you can test at high frequencies that's useful for adults. But typically uh, for adults, you would use a different set of tests. You would use the one essentially where you're sending sounds into the ear and asking if you can hear. And there are other sorts of tests um, that you can do. But typically uh, newborns is the main population for the precise purpose that they cannot uh, respond to sound. But yeah. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. So the accuracies for those is determined by the clinician, where typically uh, they would use either a mix of if they previously had a newborn screen or if they had clinical history. And we actually had the doctor kind of collectively aggregate um, their wisdom, essentially, over all the clinical tests that were performed. Some of them, they had clinical tests prior. Some of them did not. But the doctor kind of uh, used their discretion to kind of pick uh, exactly what the ground truth would be. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, it's not above the ADC range, but uh, to give you an idea of um, uh, the magnitude of the signals coming from the cochlea, those can be negative 10 to 10 dBSPR. And zero dBSPR is the limit for human hearing. So that's pretty low. Um, normally, the transmitted signal that you send in is about 80 dBSPR. So the reflections that might come back may be anywhere from 80 to 60 to 50, and, and can be anywhere within that range. But that could overwhelm that like zero dBSPR signal coming from the cochlea. Yes, that's right. If you actually, um, if you measure that signal over a period of time, about one minute, you can actually reduce the noise floor sufficiently to actually tease out those signals that are actually very soft. Oh, um, you can keep improving the noise floor by, um, um, by averaging over time. And at least with these cheap microphones, it is, with the, it is within the digitization range that you can actually pick out those things. But yeah, it's normally about a minute and you can tease those sounds out. Yes. Any other questions? Yes.
so uh, right now we're not doing cancellation. We're finding the duration at which the reflections occur. And I can actually tell you the performance of echo cancellation because um, if you don't mind, that would actually bring me to my next um, evaluation, which is if you use the um, algorithms on this $5,000 devices, which is actually echo cancellation, that will not work very well on this low cost device. So and that kind of illustrates, in fact, I'll show you the performance. If you use echo cancellation on this device, you don't get very good performance. But if you use the algorithm that I described uh, just now, and that's basically co-designing the hardware and the software together, you get a much better performance like this, which illustrates that you do in fact need to design custom algorithms to get it to work on these low cost devices. Yes. Yes. How does that variance, where in this process does that variance come from? Does it calibrate per device or is it just completely decentralized? Oh, so for this specific system, uh, this is this one particular system is using a uh, custom speaker and microphone, but it's off the shelf, like one or two dollars, it's nothing special. But if you were to do calibration, like let's say, it is decayed over time. Let's say one year from now, the acoustic response is not as good. What you could do is you could, um, the main thing that you want to calibrate for is the volume. Because if the volume you send in is not the same every time, you're not going to get the same signal from the cochlea. So you could definitely do that by putting it in like a calibration tube or putting it here, and then just uh, kind of making sure that uh, whatever you receive from the microphone uh, matches some reference value. You could do something like that uh, to ensure calibration. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, in this evaluation, we evaluated the hundred. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. I see. So the way that we came to this result is um, typically when you do the test, you're going to get a signal to noise ratio at four bands, one, two, three, four, five kilohertz. And what we said was as long as each band is above six dB, that is a pass for that band. And if you have three bands or more that pass, then that test will pass. And we use that to calculate this accuracy. And that's what was done for the clinical device. And that was also done for this device. And that's how you calculate it. Oh, for the ground truth, that is based on, um, typically for some babies, they do a uh, more extensive diagnostic test, uh, something that like connects electrodes to their brain. And sometimes we use that, but that's a more uh, time consuming test. Uh, and for others, um, the doctor will use their best judgment based on like prior tests that we've done uh, in prior months. So the doctor kind of averages together all the ground truth information and clinical information that they have to come to that ground truth. But it's the same ground truth that they were both referred to. Yeah. I think the question is that both are computing error related to something. Yes. Is that a ground truth or gold standard available for all participants? It is available for all participants in this analysis. So we only present, we, yes, yeah, so we only we will only present information where you have both the ground truth our device and the clinical device, you have all three, and then that kind of gets us this graph here. But there's no error bar for this because this is just computing accuracy. It's just uh, some set of people pass, some set of people failed, and then you just compute uh, accuracy for that. So this isn't like a cross validation or anything like that. It's just a straight accuracy computation. Yes. Okay. So, um, hopefully that evaluation, I think, should have showed you that actually co-designing the software and the hardware together is in fact necessary to get that high clinical accuracy and that low cost. Now, we've been engaged very closely with our partner clinics in Kenya, where we're trying to uh, deploy this very thoughtfully with local partners. And you can see this is a test that I'm performing on a child and you get the same results as you can. You can actually see the four bars there, one, two, three, four, five kilohertz, where you get the signal to noise ratio, and that's the same as the traditional clinical device. And we've also been engaged very closely with clinicians 
uh, at the Ministry of Health in Kenya and at the University of Nairobi. And given all this interest, we've started an international organization where the goal here is to try to thoughtfully uh, deploy this technology and enable more accessible hearing care in Kenya. We've also started collaborations with NGOs that are working in other places like Nepal and Mongolia to see how we can thoughtfully roll them out uh, because every different country has different clinical systems. So that's kind of how we're working with them. Now, I've showed you two different systems, right, for the ear, detecting ear infections and detecting hearing loss. Uh, there's this third system, which I won't go into detail for, but that one is a more detailed diagnostic test. With these two are more um, screening tests, the first order test, this is a more detailed test that can actually quantitatively tell you the mobility of the eardrum quantitatively, and I'll put a graph, and tell you uh, what disorders you may have, but I won't go into detail for that in this particular presentation. But the big picture here is that across all of these three things, we're actually democratizing uh, the field of audiology by making all these medical devices a lot more accessible. So let's go back to our outline here and change gears to the third system, which is an ambient sensing system for cardiac arrest detection. So in fact, out of hospital cardiac arrest is one of the leading causes of death. About 300,000 people die annually out of the hospital and they often die alone at home uh, without much chance of survival. CPR, if it's performed in a timely manner, can in fact save these patients, but that's uh, not always an easy option to have. Now, existing approaches that try to analyze the health of the heart typically are designed for the smartwatch like this, but these cost um, hundreds of dollars and they're inaccessible to most of the world. But perhaps more importantly, in the context of cardiac arrest, which occur when somebody is sleeping, they may not be wearing a smartwatch, which will not be able to detect their cardiac arrest. So instead of taking the wearable approach, what we decided to do is to look at audible biomarkers that are associated with a cardiac arrest specifically agonal breathing, which is a very disordered form of breathing that occurs in about 50% of cardiac arrests when the patient's oxygen levels are really low and it's almost like their last dying breath. And I do want to play that sound for you. And if you prefer not to hear that sound, uh, please close your ears and I will do a thumbs up uh, when I'm done playing the sound. Okay, I will play that sound one more time. Okay, I'm done uh, playing this out. Our hypothesis here is that we can design real-time algorithms that can actually pick out the sounds on commodity devices and potentially alert emergency medical services in time to administer CPR. The bigger picture here is really an ambient sensing system where these can be deployed on Amazon Alexis that are anyway just passively listening and can be used to pick out these sounds. We can, in fact, because this is such a privacy sensitive uh, thing, all our algorithms are designed to run in real time on the device and none of the data is sent to the cloud. There are several data set collection challenges that we have to address here. The first is that uh, agonal breathing uh, is not something that can be simulated in a lab setting. It's, uh, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I'll just wait for a few seconds. Okay. Uh, so agonal breathing is not something that you can simulate in a lab setting. It only occurs in real cases of cardiac arrest. The second challenge is that it's really challenging to collect a data set of non-agonal breathing instances. And finally, it's really challenging to manually collect data across all sorts of different environments. So we take a data-driven approach here to actually curate a data set that would be representative of the real acoustic environment that this would be deployed in. And to do this, we leverage a really unique data set here of 911 calls, where the 911 operator is trying to listen for the presence of agonal breathing to decide if EMS should administer CPR. And this is where we got the data. It was um, all the 911 operators kind of said, okay, that yes, there is agonal breathing in this data. And to collect a variety of non-agonal breathing data, we went to a sleep lab and collected about 80 or so hours of sleep data that included different forms of breathing, like snoring, regular breathing, and different apneas. And finally, to ensure that our breathing data represented a diverse range of environments, we crowdsourced this data from Amazon Mechanical Turk, 
for about 160 hours or so, sleep sound, and about 35 participants uh, did the study. We basically asked the participants to take a phone and record themselves sleeping normally for the duration of about a day. That's what we did there. So building these type of systems uh, to accurately detect cardiac arrest does also require technical challenges in building the system. The first is that there's going to be a class imbalance because you have a very small amount of agonal breathing data and a much larger amount of non-agonal <laughs> breathing data. The second challenge is that this system needs to generalize to different hardware and different environments. And finally, it needs to achieve a low false alarm rate because you don't want this thing to go off when you're just breathing normally. To address these challenges, we actually leverage uh, data augmentation, where the idea is you can play these agonal breathing sounds over the air from a speaker and record it at a microphone, like a smart speaker or smartphones. And we had a different diversity of smart devices and measured it across different distances. And we also played different interfering sounds like cats and dogs that would typically be heard in an indoor setting. To ensure that this system can generalize to real world environments, we would fine tune the classifier to a few minutes of data for every new environment that is deployed in, so it's fine tuned to that environment. And the final challenge to address that of a, fall, a low false alarm rate is as follows. The idea is that our classifier will produce a result yes or no, or probability yes or no, at every time step. And the frequency at which it outputs those predictions should match three to six breaths per minute, which is the typical breathing rate in which agonal breathing occurs. And that's much lower than regular breathing. We evaluated the sensitivity of our classifier on detecting agonal breathing on the 911 cause and got a sensitivity of 97%. And we evaluated our false alarm rate on the sleep data and on the Amazon mechanical tote data. And after applying our frequency, a breathing frequency filter, we could reduce the false alarm rate from 0.2 to 0%. Now, I believe there are a lot of really important opportunities here where instead of, um, of going beyond point of care diagnostics uh, for mobile devices, but towards the long-term monitoring of life-threatening diseases like cardiac arrest, which are actually very difficult to predict. And you actually have to do that outside the clinic. You can't do that in a clinical setting. This technology has been licensed to Sound Life Sciences, a UW startup that has been acquired by Google, which is very exciting for the future of this technology. So I presented to you three systems here during the course of my PhD, and you may have noticed that um, all of them leverage acoustics. There is, but I want to tell you that there's more sensors in the smartphone beyond acoustics that we can use for diagnostics. And I'm going to show you a short vignette of a system that leverages the vibration motors on the phone to do diagnostics. It's a point of care test uh, using the phone's vibration motor, and it's actually related to blood clot testing here. This is the tiny attachment here, and that's a tiny cup containing blood. Blood clot testing is really important for millions of people because um, they're on blood thinners, and the time it takes the blood to clot can actually vary over the day, depending on what they eat for lunch or the medications they take. So you need to actually monitor this pretty frequently. And you can either go to the lab to do this or buy an expensive point of care device, which is not really an option, especially for folks in low and middle income countries, which is why only 40% of the time are these folks typically in the blood clotting range. And we invented a technique that is smartphone based that just uses the sensors on the smartphone to detect this clotting time. And again, this content warning because there's going to be some blood in this video, but I'll show you it's really interesting video here. Now, all you have to do in this video is prick your finger and draw a tiny drop of blood into this capillary tube. And this is a cup with a tiny copper particle in a cup holder. And you just have to deposit the blood. The vibration motor will agitate the blood sample and the copper particle so it'll keep moving around. But the moment that the blood becomes viscous, the particle will stop moving. And then you can use uh, the information from the camera that's captured to figure out exactly how long it took for the blood to clot accurately. We did a very extent, so I'm done playing the video. Um, so yeah. And we did a very extensive evaluation here. This was tested against the laboratory machines and with the uh, point of care home devices. We tested on 158 uh, whole blood measurements and 280 plasma measurements. 
And our system was able to have comparable performance to these kind of devices. So this uh, plot here is just showing the clotting times measured by the laboratory device and the smartphone-based uh, device, as you can see over there. And this is another example of how using mobile systems, we can really create a lot of frugal and high quality tools to bring healthcare and make it much more accessible. I want to end with a few minutes on my future research agenda, because I really believe we're in a unique and exciting time in terms of mobile healthcare. And it's important to make big bets in the future. And my goal here really is to ensure that every human being on the planet can have access to basic medical diagnostics at their fingertips. Now, remote health monitoring is one potential way in which you could achieve this vision. And indeed, during COVID-19, the adoption of telemedicine increased significantly across two years. The problem still is that to get any type of clinical test, you typically still require an in-person visit. Now, my work on ear infections is one example of a remote test, but there is so much more that you can do here. And my goal here is really to enable telemedicine to be just as effective as an in-person visit. There's a lot more that you can do here also with ambient sensing systems. I mentioned to you my cardiac arrest system, which is a system in the home setting. But you can imagine if you translated this to public spaces, like train stations or buses or offices, where you could contactlessly sense the health of everyone in this room without any wearable sensors, you could create a real-time barometer of the state of a city's health. And this does require the development of new sensors and algorithms that can be deployed at scale. I've been looking recently into these biohybrid sensors um, that can smell diseases. Medical studies have shown that dogs and insects can smell COVID, cancer, and diabetes. And they're millions of times more sensitive than the best tiny electronic sensors. So we've been doing some preliminary tests that combines the best of what biology and electronics have to offer. And um, this will give you an example. This is a Manduka moth here. And we were able to cut the antenna from the moth and attach it to a set of electrodes. And this is a very sensitive smell sensor, essentially. Now, this video here. Uh, yeah, so this video is showing some synthetic uh, COVID that's being puffed, uh, that's being puffed into the sensor. And you can actually see on the smartphone there that the signal is actually pretty strong. And these are electrical signals that are generated by a potential difference generated um, across that antenna. And this is just very nascent work, but I'm really excited about how this very underexplored area of smell can be used as potentially the next frontier for diagnosing diseases. Now, the final area of future work is in the area of inequities due to financial incentives. Take, for example, a patient with a rare speech impediment. If you could create a real-time translation system running on the resource constraints of a phone that could take that child's speech and translate it in real time, that could be enormously beneficial. And I like this project a lot because it's something that is difficult to do to industry because you can't just use the machine learning models used by Google that are trained on 99% of people. We still need to find a way to fine tune it to that exact patient, uh, but without requiring a ton of fine tuning uh, data. And this is an example where academics can really have an impact in the health space that can't, that's very difficult to do in industry. So finally, as I've mentioned at the beginning of my talk, I work on a broad variety of other areas in intelligent mobile systems, and I'd be happy to talk about that offline. Again, here are the three projects I've talked about, and I really believe we're just scratching the surface of what we can do in mobile healthcare. Um, here are all my collaborators from engineering through uh, lots of different departments in uh, the medical school that I've worked with over the course of my uh, degree, um, where a lot of these projects would not be possible without them. I'm really excited to lead the community in this direction, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, let's see. It's great use of the smartphone, and the smartphone is always getting more and more technology on it, better wireless, more sensors. Do you have some dream features that will transform the types of sensing uh, work that you do? Yes, yeah, so I do think that smell sensor is a great idea because that's a very nascent technology, but there hasn't been much work yet. I mean, there's so many different directions you can take, for example, how do you best represent smell? Because that's to do with chemicals. 
visually you have RGB for you know, any display, but we don't have the basis functions for smell. But you could imagine, say, creating new um, pesticides that were not um, harmful to plants by better understanding of these chemicals and doing the computational design there to deploy it in these settings or um, diagnose diseases in a much more effective way that can't really be done by today's devices. I think that's one of the future directions I'm excited about. Yes. I guess my question is also that there is only a little bit in the inside of the actual use of the second question. Hmm. Yeah, the second question, uh, I'm sure it's very good. I want to ask you this question because even in Canada, uh, here for developed by whatever development, yeah. there is still some difference between the actual system and use. So, to be an engineer, electrical engineer, that's what I would call the link was responsible for each one of the buildings. Yes. So from the frequency from the old temperature, you can do quite different functions. Yes. So if you don't do self calibration, then I'm wondering whether all of those differences can be characterized into the algorithm or it's still necessary. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. So for the first question about whether the result is continuous or binary, because of the physical principle of operation, you're literally sensing the mobility of the eardrum, which is directly proportional to the amount of fluid. You can get a continuous measure, but we only present a binary measure because that's the most reasonable to present to a patient. You don't want to present that with too many options, but there is some correlation between uh, a weak amount of fluid versus a much stronger amount of fluid, and you get a much uh, stronger signal in that case. For your second question about uh, general, could you just repeat the question because people cannot. Oh, sorry. Cannot uh, the question was: Can our middle ear fluid detector detect a continuous range of the amount of fluid from a very small amount of fluid to a very large amount of fluid? And the answer is yes, because we're literally sensing the eardrum mobility that is directly proportional to the amount of fluid. But we do just present a binary result because that's what makes the most sense from, I guess, a human factors uh, perspective. And so the second question is about uh, diverse forms of hardware, especially the earphone design. How do you calibrate the impulse response across these? So um, I'll give you the example of the smartphone one because that's different smartphones with different microphones and speakers. And we did use that uh, impulse response calibration where you place the finger here, you send out a signal and you get back the response. And that takes into account the variation in frequency response across different hardware. And basically in our testing, we trained on one smartphone, froze the model and tested on a completely new smartphone that is calibrated in the same way. We were compensating for the frequency response and we got comparable results. And that's what we did for the middle ear detection thing. For the hearing loss thing, you could imagine doing it in a similar way where you were covering it or so on. And you can do an initial test where you compensate for the frequency response, uh, the impulse response in the frequency domain and make sure that it's the same uh, sound level because it is important in these tests that it is in fact the same sound level. So that's how we did it. Um, but for this one, we use custom hardware, um, just to clarify. Yes. Yes, I see we have <clears throat> many participants. So I, in the chat, I don't see any. Um, there is an, uh, you may have asked, okay. Beno Hajang is asking how sensitive is the ear detection? Why is the patient's movement? So if there's a large amount of movement, then the test uh, will have difficulty distinguishing between the signal and the movement. But this is the same for essentially any technology on the market out there. There is no technology out there on the market that can detect if you're moving around. However, you can use the motion sensors on the phone to basically flag to the user if there is motion and show an error on the screen. And in fact, we also use the motion sensors to ensure that the phone is upright at this angle. So they're not like placing it uh, at a large angle offset like this, where it may be a little difficult. So you can um, at least account for the motion by detecting it in that way.
So in the third technology, we assume that it's in a relatively uh, normal home because that's representative of the real acoustic environment with its cardiac arrest happening, uh, a relatively quiet uh, setting. Um, that's kind of how we defined it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, sometimes it fails because. Uh, the question, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, the question is uh, at what are the points where the ear infection technology uh, fails? The reason why it fails is that sometimes um, there are a number of reasons. Sometimes the ear fluid will progress back and forth throughout the day. So it is possible that at times where you measure the ear fluid at one instance and a few minutes later, um, it's a little hard to measure the fluid. So because it varies over the course of a day, that can be a source of some small level of uh, inaccuracy. So the eardrum may not be so uh, um, in, in, uh, impacted by the ear fluid, like if you have a very small amount of fluid. So it's basically those boundary conditions but it's essentially the same at those specialist tools that are also trying to probe the eardrum mobility. And those are also about 80 to 90% or so. Okay. So most of your work, you're trying to do things where you edge the device, as you mentioned a variety of different phones, but capabilities, let's say, emerging on those might be to simpler phones with less capabilities. If you have a range of GPU processor uh, requirements, and if you had twice as fast for the GPU and twice as fast for the processor, who would need more? So the question was, um, especially in these low and middle income countries, they may use phones that have low end processors. And is there a path towards using higher cost uh, processors, I suppose, uh, GPUs or things? My take on this problem is that you need to attack this from both angles. You should attack it from the hardware side and the software side. So for the hardware side, you can design new chips, accelerators, and so on, because indeed on the latest iPhones, you can actually do inference pretty fast. And it's actually a really big contrast between the latest iPhone versus something 10 years back. That's the hardware side. But on the software side, you should really be making these machine learning algorithms like the neural networks much more efficient, uh, especially for that rare disease uh, project that I was talking about before. That requires the invention of new techniques uh, where you can't just use off-the-shelf optimization techniques like pruning or quantization to make it faster. You actually need completely new networks to make those go faster. So by attacking it at both angles, you can probably serve the best of both markets. It's not an either-or problem. You kind of have to go on all the directions to solve it. That's my answer. Yes. Um, There's more of like a feature directing work. So a lot of very interesting, but very awesome stuff. Yeah. And a lot of this work was involving audio with RX sound channels, right? So the ear canal was like respiratory system for the last one. Uh, but I'm sure like all the organs are sending out sound signals in some sense. Like just a live example is when we are hungry, our tummy crops, like for yes. a baby. I hope that's the case. Right. So any comments on like how to develop methods or systems where you have to, you don't have an amplifying channel, like a ear channel, um, and diagnose for other organs. So one other project that I've been really interested in is fetal heartbeat monitoring. So let's say you're a pregnant woman with a child and you want to get the heartbeat of the child of the baby, which is uh, moves the least compared to say the mother's breathing and the heartbeat. Uh, one approach, as you say, is a sound channel approach, where maybe you have an earbud in the ear with the in-ear facing microphone, and maybe you could hear the baby's heartbeat through the ear canal, but maybe you don't want to wear an earphone every day. In that case, you could have some type of contactless technology, like an Alexa that's sending out active sonar. And in fact, uh, these Alexas are having higher sampling rates nowadays. Like now they're doing like 96 kilohertz. So you get much higher bandwidth. And potentially that means you get a better distance resolution and you can pick up those minute motions uh, better. So I would kind of select problems where maybe you don't just have the acoustic channel, but you have other side channels like motion, which you can detect. And th that basically opens uh, your uh, solution space to a much larger set of technologies that you can use to tackle that problem. Okay, one last question. Now we'll move it to uh, outside to yes. the- uh, Yeah, go ahead. Oh, 
Oh, right now, um, we do not need to clean the sensor as long as you puff it. Uh, it kind of goes back to zero, so you can do multiple puffs. But um, uh, yeah, I yeah. So multiple puffs is fine. You don't basically you don't need to clean the antenna at this point in time. Um, right now, it's not an issue. Um, if it is an issue, I think that would be an interesting challenge to think about in terms of maybe putting kind of some kind of sleeve over it that can prevent contamination, but not reduce the signal to noise ratio. So I think that's basically a future challenge to see if that contamination problem can be solved if it does exist. But right now, as it stands in these lab settings, um, that contamination is not really a big issue. Okay, so we have a reception waiting outside and we can ask more questions 